I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus. And hello to those of you on the internet, wherever and whatever you are. My name is Joe Damar, and I'm here with my incredible co-host... Rebecca Wood! Yes, and today Rebecca and I are going to craft yet another amazing hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about it in the ways that it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and your family and the trees that are turning colors and the bees that are getting ready for winter and the cheese that you eat because you know those are little bacteria in there making cheese for you and they get affected by stuff that happens in, in the world too so basically everyone and everything that's alive on the planet because like it or not we are all here together but wh why do we only care about now about things that that, that end in e's joe <laughs> <laughs> It, it, well, because today, you know, because we're, we're coming up on Halloween. Oh, okay. Right. And it's, it's kind of like a screaming kind of. I see. Okay. It's like, kind of like an it. E. It's like a theme. Right. A theme today. Right. So, uh, so, Ed, so happy uh, Halloween to people that celebrate ha Halloween. And uh, my pagan friends are celebrating what I used to call Samhain, but I guess it's pronounced Something like Samhain or Samhain? Samhain, yeah, I don't right. Know. And of course, then we've got All Saints Day, we've got the Day of the Dead. It's, it's a, seems Ask an ancient Keld, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a dumb Sasana. Right. But it's a, it's a fun time, and we're going to have a fun show. we got a, a good show. We're going to chat for a few more minutes here. You can join us, actually, anytime during the show at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. Calling us about any kind of environmental ep ep issue that you want to learn about. Then we're going to have an interview with uh, Jayaraman Sivaguru, who is a uh, professor. He's, he's a researcher in chemistry at the BGSU at Bowling Green State University. He's come up with uh, this incredible new plastic. It's made out of vanilla, vanillin. And uh, it, that, he, it can be biodegraded, at, or not biodegraded, it can be degraded at will, so it's uh, very recyclable. It's cool. I like to talk to scientists, you know, kind of get that mix up in there. Well, they have interesting things to say. Yeah, and they're, and they're so enthusiastic about the stuff they create. So True. It's nice. Uh, then, also, I'm very enthusiastic. We will, after that, hear from our advertisers and patrons. And uh, then, Rebecca, uh, what will you share with us this week? Bats. Just an overview of bats, so as to leave myself uh, room later to uh, narrow it down if I need to do individual bat species. <laughs> okay. And so that's also appropriate for this time of the year. Yes. Um, then we've got a whole bunch of ecological news to talk about. And, uh, you know, it's the usual mix of good and bad news, but I promise the last story... Uh, is really good. The, the, the story we're going to end on this week is downright inspiring. Gosh darn it. So uh, looking forward to that. Okay, so um, as we said, it's 
it's that time of the year where we're talking about uh, ghosts and ghouls and so forth. And uh, one of the most ghoulish things that's going on in the country right now is uh, going happening up there in Michigan, which is uh, where Governor Whitmer is trying to resurrect the closed Palisades nuclear power plant. And so uh, our friends over at Beyond Nuclear organized a little protest yesterday on the lawn of the State House in Lansing, Michigan, and I, I attended. It was a fun protest. The uh, theme was zombies. We were all supposed to go dressed up as zombies because, you know, Governor Whitmer is trying to resurrect a dead nuclear plant, which uh, died. You know, it, it should stay dead. One of the reasons it shut down is that the metal on the inside is all embrittled. And if you start it up again, it's likely to just break and, and have a meltdown. Oy vey. But, um, but it was a, a very, uh, it's nice to sometimes just get together with people and sort of have fun. It was a very fun little protest. Um, and I uh, heard a lot of speakers. There was a fella doing some music there. It was, it was good. And heard a lot of stories about the history of anti-nuclear activism in Michigan that I didn't know about. You know, for one thing, people talked a lot about a place called Rocky Point, which was an experimental reactor where they were trying to develop new reactor technologies. And because it was experimental, it didn't even have the lax oversight that NRC gives its other nuclear plants. It did, Boy, that sounds fun. Yeah, contaminated a whole bunch of uh, areas with all kinds of radionuclides, and there's still a little fence around the site of the old reactor. Uh, which, <laughs> of course, the fence is going to stop those things from spreading. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, right. Um, so I, I spoke there, and I, I talked a little bit about um, what hap what's been happening on Twitter with the pro-nuclear trolls who are, are putting out the, the lies. And one of the biggest lies is uh, no one died from Chernobyl, from the radiation caused by Chernobyl. And we've talked about that before on the Yeah, on the I, show. I knew a guy in the 90s who had been a missionary over at a Unitarian. Unitarians are actually from Transylvania. But anyway, oh, like, okay. that's where it started. Huh. On, but yeah, um, he, he had been a missionary over there, and he knew lots of people who were dying from Chernobyl. Right. I mean, that's... and that's the. It was kind of a downer. He talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's the case over and over again, that if you talk to the people who are actually downwind of things like nuclear bomb testing, mm -hmm. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, you know, they, uranium mining, you know, they will tell you in no uncertain terms, you know, we're, we're dying like crazy here, but somehow, like with Three Mile Island, the reason I brought this up today is because I just encountered it literally again this morning from a pro-nuclear troll on Twitter who said, oh, there was no increase in cancer from Three Mile Island. And, you know, we've had Dr. Heidi Hutner on, We've had uh, other scientists on that have done demographic studies of that area, which has the highest cancer rate in the nation. And they were, they're all like, yeah, people are dying. And so um, it's just interesting that we, again, have to uh, face just outright lies, just that gas lighting. And it's the same lies over and over again. And uh, one of the problems with Palisades that was brought up at the protest is that before Palisades started up there in Michigan, that area, that region had a below average cancer rate. Mm -hmm. And once Palisades started up, their cancer rate shot up immediately. And as long as Palisades was running, they had a 15% higher cancer rate than the rest of the country. And so that mirrors the, the experience of other areas that have had nukes that, you know, low cancer rate, before the Dukes, high cancer rate during the Dukes, and even some places that have shut their Dukes back to low cancer rate after the Dukes shut down. So, um, yeah, it's just, again... I wish, I wish sometimes yeah. they could be actual trolls, because that would be much cooler. <laughs> they wouldn't know how to use technology, probably. They'd just bash it if they found it, you know? Well, it, it, you know, they, probably the grammar would be They might be eat good. some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They might, you know, be hitting their keyboards with their clubs. There we go, yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it was just fun, and sometimes sometimes you need that, you know? Sometimes you just need to go and hang out with a bunch of like-minded people and dress up and 
a lot of imaginative costumes and a lot of uh, really good protest signs. So that was a good time. Joe weirded a couple of, of kids out, apparently. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I did, it, you know. <laughs> well, so pe there weren't many people because it was Saturday afternoon. Uh, on the state house lawn, but about a dozen people wandered by at some point or other. A couple of them had come over and were kind of, you know, looking at the stuff over. And <laughs> but but having a zombie come up to them and like hand them literature and start talking to them, they they got a little leery. They're kind of like, eh, thank you anyway. And, yeah, <laughs> wandered off, but it was still fun. All right, well, and uh, also had fun interviewing. Uh, Jayaraman Sivaguru from Bowling Green State University, and he's going to talk to us about this new plastic they've developed. So, Josh, let's go ahead and go. Hello, and interview. welcome to For a Green Future. Uh, could you just please tell us your name and your position? Yeah, I am uh, Dr. Jayaraman Sivaguru, uh, and I am the Distinguished University Professor at uh, Bowling Green State University. All right, well, thank you for coming on, Dr. Sivaguru. And um, you are, or you have been for a long time, working on a, a very vital problem, ecologically speaking, uh, in terms of uh, plastics, correct? Yes. Yeah. And in fact, as I understand it, you've developed a, a new sort of plastic that uses vanillin to make a plastic that's actually biodegradable. Uh, yeah, it is not biodegradable, but rather photodegradable. It is degradable with light. Aha, uh -huh, I uh, see. Not any kind of light. Uh, it is, uh, 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 you know, UV light so that, you know, it doesn't degrade when, you know, it is exposed to sun, for example. So uh, you can degrade them with UV light, uh, you know, around 300 nanometers. That is not uh, very prevalent in, you know, outside in the environment, uh, you know, upon exposure to sun. So, and that is the, you know, uh, the unique feature uh, of the methodology we have developed here. So 300 nanometers, that's an especially short wavelength, is that right? Yeah, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a high energy, uh, you know, short wavelength light, yeah. Okay, and, and you say it, it's not very prevalent in nature, but I'm assuming there might be a little bit of it, so that if the plastic got left very, out... Very, very trace amount that uh, comes through the ozone, right? So most of the light is filtered uh, filtered out. Uh, typically, we have only visible light. Little bit of, you know, uh, UV light, you know, around 360, 370 nanometers. But by the time you go to around 300, uh, there, is, there is no uh, intensity in terms of, you know, uh, that reaches the surface of the Earth. Okay. So the advantage of having plastic that you could degrade when you want to by shining this light on it um, is what exactly? What is the advantage of having a plastic like that? So, so uh, one, you know, um, you are doing it in a very controlled setting, right? So you are going to degrade it when you want to degrade it. Um, so, so that means, you know, you have a much better control on uh, how this process can go. Uh, for example, you know, if you're allowing a plastic to degrade in the environment, uh, uh, of course it is going to degrade over time depending upon the type of plastic. Uh, but, you know, during that time when it is degrading, uh, uh, some of the plastics, uh, you know, that break down into small pieces, these are called microplastics, that can uh, get into the environment. By doing this in a controlled uh, environment, our hope is to prevent that microplastic from essentially going out. So th that is that is uh, what our hope and aim is. I see. So this is a, a very recyclable sort of plastic. Correct. So yeah, it can be upcycled to a different form, yes. Okay. And, and when you degrade it, so you've got your plastic and you shine your UV light on it, it degrades. What does it degrade into? So um, essentially we make a you know, we make this polymer, like you mentioned, from vanillin. Um, so that vanillin, uh, you can consider, you know, it is a plant-based uh, compound, you know, you can derive it from various sources that are bio-based. Um, and then you, from that vanillin, you make a, a compound called a monomer. You can consider this monomer as a Lego piece, okay? And then you build a polymer from this Lego piece, and you can now call this polymer as a Lego set. Um, and uh, once you make use of the polymer, in this case it is a cross-linked polymer, um, uh, you essentially can shine light and degrade it back to the monomer you started with. So you not only are degrading it, but you are going back to the material you started with so that you can recycle them. Uh, so we have done this one in 
two different ways. You know, our first generation one was done in the, you know, almost six, seven years ago. We were able to recycle it at 40% efficiency. Now we have moved up to 65% efficiency. So, um, so, so the idea being, you know, you can make these materials that are plant derived, um, uh, so biomass derived, degradable, unrecyclable materials. So, so a Lego, the, the best analogy to uh, visualize is, you know, you are farming a Lego piece from biomass, um, and then once you make the polymer, which is a Lego set, you degrade it back to the Lego piece. So essentially you're disassembling and assembling the system. Uh-huh. So what do these plastics physically look like once you've degraded them? Are they like little balls or is it like a... No, typically the way that we synthesize these are cross-linked, they become like powder. So powder. these are, you know, yeah. So these these are powders, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, this is more of a proof of a concept that we can, one can show that, you know, you can use light to essentially degrade the material, not only degrade the material, go back to the material you started with, and then you can upcycle them to a different form, so. Ah, I see. So it's taken you, you know, you've been working on this for a long time. Um, so what exactly were you tweaking? I mean, how, what were you spending the last years where you improved the efficiency? Was it the shape of the molecule or was it, uh, how, what were you working on? Uh, so a project like this is, you know, typically uh, it cannot be solved by one person. You know, actually we are a team of people consisting of different backgrounds. So one of them is a synthetic chemist, uh, the other one is a polymer chemist, and I am a photochemist. So, so you know, various properties needs to be adjusted. For example, how efficiently you can uh, degrade. Our first generation polymer, for example, that was degrading at around 360 nanometers. Uh, and it took us around four to six hours to degrade. Uh, these things can be degraded in less than an hour. Uh, so, wow. so one is to increase the efficiency of the system, uh, how to make it more uh, efficient in terms of its recyclability. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, when you're degrading it, how much you can recover it back. In the first uh, uh, generation, we were able to recover 40% of the monomer, which I said as a Lego piece, so that you can recycle them. Um, this, in the second generation, which is this uh, polymer that is derived from vanillin, we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially recover around 65%. So we have, you know, gone up. So so the efficiency has gone up. So our eventual aim, uh, even in a prototype system, is to go towards 90, 95 plus, so that, you know, this one can eventually be translated uh, for commercial applications. Uh, that is our aim, uh, using this type of strategy. Well, that's cool. Uh, and so when a photon, you know, degrades one of these molecules, uh, what, what actually happens? Does it like smash through a chemical bond or does it get absorbed and something changes to something else? Or, or how does that photon change the physical thing of the plastic? Okay, so, you know, uh, molecules uh, or uh, polymers, anything, these are made up of bonds, uh, you know, essentially electrons that are holding atoms together. Uh, when you shine light, what happens is you are essentially, uh, you know, uh, breaking uh, the interaction between the electrons, so they just come apart. So the way that we designed this system is, you know, vanillin has a specific functionality that can be tailored to absorb light, and once it absorbs light, these electrons just, you know, uh, in the bonds can be, uh, you know, uh, taken apart, so that is what bond breakage is, so you essentially break one of the bonds that eventually leads to the degradation of the backbone and that's how the polymer degrades i see so the so the photon just kind of knocks the electrons apart from each other no, uh, yeah so uh, in, a, in a physical sense it doesn't knock out the electron it changes you know it takes the electron from one configuration to another configuration um so uh, the way that one can visualize this is uh, you know uh, you have uh, you know, like, um, uh, how can I, you know, like, you know, a set of uh, coins, let's say that, you know, uh, consider, you know, a set of chess piece coins that you consider as the normal configuration. When you shine light, that one of the chess piece coins moves up, right? So now the 
the board is disturbed so uh, so that's what happens in a molecule uh, the molecule under normal ground state will have an arrangement of electrons in a particular fashion like the chess coins and then when you shine light one of the coins will move out uh, to a different uh, you know square so in this case it will go to a different level so the uh-huh. electron is not ripped off uh, essentially you are not taking the chess piece out of the chess board but rather you are moving from one square to another square here you are just moving from one uh, uh, place which we call the orbital to another orbital so right. yeah that's what happens yeah well cool um so I, i'm assuming that you you're looking down the line at possible uh commercial applications for this would this be suitable for any sort of plastic in the possibly in the future or uh might there be some that are better suited than others so yeah our eventual goal is to commercialize this and for that you know again you know this is you know we are just taking baby steps here first we want to even demonstrate that this is indeed feasible um and that's what we have been doing with this stuff so um so our eventual goal is to you know make this one work not only for plastic but also for composites you know uh, because you know like composites are used in various uh, systems uh, you know uh, one is you know your wind turbines for example uh, is something you know uh, is made of composites there are many uh, you know high performance materials that are made of composites and they are made so that they are durable for a long period of time so and that has its downside uh, because you know if it is durable for a long period of time when when its lifetime is over the end of life issue becomes a big uh, uh, big problem because it starts to accumulate so um, so by having a strategy where you can degrade if if we can translate this one to those type of composite system we can, after its lifetime is over uh, we can eventually degrade them so that it doesn't build up in the environment another aspect is you know uh, you know there are precious chemicals sometimes that are embedded within these composites uh, will be able to you know essentially recover those precious chemical and recycle them that's that's our goal maybe you know down the line 10 20 years down the line so ah all right cool well um so what was the most i can't i don't know if you have to get too technical for this but uh what was the most uh, surprising or interesting thing that you discovered while you were doing the research on this uh yeah so like i mentioned you know uh, a problem like this uh, is not uh, is most likely not solved by one person or a person having one expertise it really requires a team because you know you you need to have uh, different uh, expertise that have to come together to solve a problem of this scale so uh, that means you know you have to learn uh, you know what is the language that the other discipline is uh, you know is talking so so that is something which is very interesting because you know uh, you know my background um, you know is in photochemistry so you you want to learn something different you know uh, based upon your collaboration so th- those are all the interesting aspects that uh, uh, you know uh, both me and my students uh, found out you know you know how we can we can learn new things you know uh, in some sense you are going a little bit outside your comfort zone and that's what research is all about you know typically uh, when you are doing any cutting edge research it's typically outside your comfort zone because you are venturing into something which is brand new right so yeah right. so those are the last bit we really liked yes all right well thank you very much uh, is there anything you you'd like to add um you know uh even though i have the pl- pleasure of talking with you uh, i want to highlight you know the contributions of students you know uh, these uh, type of things happens because of the work of students you know um, you know they put in their effort you know multiple students working over uh, you know uh, now close to 6 7 years on this one project to develop this thing you know it is all credit goes to them uh, so that is something which i want to emphasize all right well well thank you very much dr siva okay. guru I you know it's it's always fun inter- interviewing scientists about the thing they work on cuz they you know they're obviously so into it so uh, that's our interview with Dr. Shayaraman Sivaguru. So now we go on to our advertisers and patrons. Hooray. For Green Futures brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats and they lead people on outdoor adventures. 
And there's several ways you can get a hold of them and see what they're doing. Uh, one is to uh, call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. Another is to go to their website, which is wcparks.org. And uh, you can also go to any app store and download their app, which is uh, simply called WC Parks. And they're on all the, the social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And WC Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year. Four Green Futures also brought to you by our patrons. And our patrons are wonderful people who have gone to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and they've signed up at a level that matches theirs. They just searched for For a Green Future, up popped our Patreon page, and they signed up, and we, we got another patron this past week, which uh, for which I'm very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's sort of a returning patron that somebody who had patronized briefly and then they now they're repatronizing so uh we're that's the one time when we, we really don't mind patronizing you know when they're patronizing our show and giving us money i'm willing to be patronized in that situation so uh thank you very much for our patrons and rebecca that brings us to your se segment of the show and what will we be talking about this week Bats, batty bats, a very large subject, it turns out. Uh, mm. They're an entire order of mammals, uh. not just a family. And, uh, you know, usually we talk about maybe, you know, genus, species, and you know, family at biggest. But, yeah, uh, they're the order Chiroptera, if that's how you say it. And they are the only mammals capable of true and sustained flight. They're also more agile flyers than birds because of something called a patagium, which is like the membrane that covers their wings. Uh, they range from Kitty's hognose bat, which is a six inch wingspan, to the largest would be the, the golden crowned flying fox at five feet seven inches maximum wingspan. <laughs> okay. They're the second largest order of mammals after the rodent, and they, they comprise 20% of all classified mammals that we know about. Wow, I yeah. did not realize that 20% of mammals were bats. And that is the thing, like, we, we think of, of bats as something sort of, I do anyway, rare and unusual because I just don't see them very much, you know. Mm -hmm, right. But they're not. They're, they just don't want you to see them, <laughs> is what it is. Um, within that, there's two suborders. They're in the process of being uh, rearranged and renamed and whatnot, so just, you know, big old under construction sign there. But uh, I believe the gist of it is that more species are going to be, of, of the microbats are going to be shuffled in with the megabats, a.k.a. the foxes, flying foxes, that weren't before. Uh, mm. Bats eat, different species eat fruit, insects, nectar, blood. Uh, and uh, some species actually, there's like one or two that eat fish, birds, frogs, lizards, and sometimes other bats. There's a species, that's like one species of bat that, predates another species of bat, exactly. Uh, most of them are nocturnal. Uh, they're pretty much worldwide except for the Arctic and the Antarctic. The bats are everywhere. Um, they're very helpful ecologically because they pollinate and spread seeds. And uh, there are some tropical plants that depend completely on, a, on bats for this. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to survive. Um, they do other good stuff, like they make guano, which is useful for fertilizer and, I don't know, gunpowder or something. Mm -hmm. People use guano right. for stuff. Yeah. Get the nitrates out of there. Obviously, less insects. Keeping insects under control is often good. They attract tourists. In some areas, they're eating as food. Uh, small problem, they spread diseases. Uh, they're very good at this because they're mobile and social and long-lived. So, like, like us, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's something special about their immune systems, too, that makes them immune to many of the diseases that they spread. So that would be something to study, because maybe they can tell us something about how to resist disease. They're famous for roosting in caves, but they'll take kind of any sheltered nook, depending on the species and what's available. Uh, there's at least one species that makes tents out of leaves. Interesting. Interestingly. Megabats, the, the, big, the flying foxes, tend to roost in trees and... Uh, 
and most of them, some, some, a few species are diurnal or crepuscular, meaning they what, feed at twilight and dawn, I think. Right. Or just one of those. Yep. Uh, they're having a problem right now with white nose syndrome, which, which is killing millions of bats in the eastern United States and Canada. It's gone as far west as Texas. Um, it's a fungus, basically, that grows on bats that have it. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, they're resistant to pathogens. Um, there's one species that's almost completely solitary, although almost all of them live in large colonies. They're all about togetherness of the bats, and they like to do food sharing and grooming to preserve this. So, yeah, you could just go on and on forever about bats. They're really interesting and kind of unique, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> mm, cool. All right. Well, th well, thank you. I'd like to add that if you go to the Toledo Zoo, I think on a Monday, they have the demonstration of where you get to watch um, vampire bats lick blood out of, warm blood out of little saucers, like like weird little spooky kittens. <laughs> it's wow. cute and disturbing at the same time. Well, given that this Monday is, is Halloween, I yeah. suppose you might... Yeah, it'd be a thing to do. It could be it an would. interesting date, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Huh. All right. Well, thanks very I think much. Monday is also the, the ones they do the those big birds with the huge bills who. Oh, the hornbills. Yeah, the hornbills, where they they the keeper explains to you that the the their inability to apparently mate or catch fruit. That mm -hmm. was what what it was when we went there. They were like, mm -hmm. we, we'll try and get the mate, but they won't. Here, let's throw them some fruit. Whoops, missed. <laughs> that was the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> but they were injured. They're, they're cool birds. Well, they I are. mean, you know. <laughs> Not every the, the pair in the Toledo Zoo is uh, kind of duds. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> well, not not every um, and or know. don't really like living in cages. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not not everybody's comfortable mating when you're inside a glass box. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Kind of a turn off for some. All right. Well, thanks, thanks, Rebecca. You're welcome. Talking about bats. Okay, and now, uh, and I just want to remind everybody that anytime you can call in eight seven seven. 909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. And uh, it's time to go on to our ecological news segment. And for our first story, uh, we are going to talk to uh, talk about uh, Enbridge in Minnesota. And you might, listeners who were listening in 2021 might remember that we uh, had a lot of interviews with people that were protesting the Enbridge pipeline there, line three that went through a whole bunch of uh, Native American re uh, reservations. And they also, everything that the people who opposed the pipeline said could happen, did happen in terms of, as part of spills and in terms of uh, puncturing the aquifers, because there's a lot of groundwater there in Minnesota. And what Enbridge did on at least three different sites that we know of, and, and allegedly as many as five or some are saying seven times, they. They dug too deep where they weren't supposed to dig, and so they punctured the aquifer, and all this, and millions and millions yeah. of gallons of groundwater poured out, and were lost. Uh, in, and in fact, uh, hundreds of millions of gallons ha this happened with. And so, we've been waiting because you know they they weren't caught by Minnesota; they were caught by the by the protesters by the. Native Americans who were following the pipeline and they documented it and they had drone pictures and they went to the state of Minnesota and said, look, <laughs> these guys are doing terrible things. And so finally, uh, what happened this past week, uh, the state of Minnesota stepped in and fined them. And uh, there's a story and the website, uh, Healing MN, Healing Minnesota Stories at .wordpress.com came out on October 18th. Title is State says it held Enbridge accountable for Line 3 damage despite evidence to the contrary. And uh, essentially what it says is that... Uh, evidence that they didn't do something or evidence that they didn't get held accountable? Evidence that the, the fines are, and penalties are so tiny oh. as to be laughable. Right. Uh, in fact, for one of the punctures, they actually only fined them $1,000, um, which... Uh, the if that's an aquifer, can you even clean those up? Some you can. Uh, they've they've patched two out of the three. One of them is still leaking uh, thousands of gallons every day. Oh, that's uh, special. Right. Uh, and what they point out in the article is that Enbridge is 
revenues are $35 billion a year. And so the total of all the penalties they're receiving is might be 11 million because a lot of it's conditional. So if you need it, we'll give you some more money to do this or that. Um, but $11 million, even if they got find the maximum penalties on all of them, that's 0.03%. <laughs> so it's basically like that car that kept exploding. What was that in the 70, the Pinto? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. The Pinto. Yeah. Complete death trap, and it turned out that they'd done the math in advance and decided that they could afford to kill some people. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they, so this is literally, again, this is pocket change for Enbridge. And uh, one of the people that we interviewed on this, uh, as, as that whole thing was happening, uh, we, we called uh, Joey Oppengard III, and he uh, gave us a statement saying, uh, Enbridge, a Canadian, got a smack on the wrist, which for a company I understand makes about 80 million a day is a drop in the barrel, drop in the barrel for. The company has been historically unfazed by these moot fines from Minnesota, like these ruptured leaks and labor violations that have led to deaths on the job. Enbridge admitted to the risks in the permitting process and the state's current administration took a blind eye. Of course, they are going to get another moot fine from a toothless regulatory agency. We now have pipelines in our aquifers, wetlands, and crossing the Mississippi River a few times. All pipelines leak and it is a matter of time so we'll be back in the courts when this line starts leaking. So question, what do we think about those people who, I don't know, threw soup on the Mona Lisa or something this week? <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. They yeah. they were, um, it was last week, and it was, uh, it wasn't the Mona Lisa, it was a Picasso. Oh, right, okay. Uh, it was the Sunflowers painting, and they were doing it to protest global warming, basically, and the lack of action on that. Right, right. Uh, oh, and I just want to say, Wait, well, Joey wasn't Peltier, Van Gogh the Sunflower dude? Was it Van Gogh? I don't know. I forget. Oh, like, someone could call it. There's a call famous. There's a bunch of big, super faint, like the top three or four paintings that you know about. You know, right? <laughs> like it was one of them. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the reaction to it. It's been kind of muted in all directions. Everybody's just sort of <laughs> not reacting to this because you know, on the one hand, it is a terrible act of vandalism, and on the other hand. The point they're making is that the whole society, including our art museums, are at risk from this continued global warming. Yeah, I don't think I could bring myself to actually do that, and yet I have to admit, you know, the great works of art are probably not going to survive the all the uh, all the hurricanes and fires and crap we're, we're looking at as this thing gets worse. You know. Yeah. So interesting question. What's what's your opinion? What's your reaction? Uh, give us a call eight seven seven. Nine zero nine one zero zero seven. I know we don't like the the evidence that our civilization is collapsing, but it kind of is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My one criticism is I don't know how effective that protest is going to be. I mean, I don't know if, right. if that's going to actually move anybody to do something that they wouldn't have done before. Do you know what I, I mean? They're kind of just, just, I mean, you know, we, we've, we've done regular demonstrations forever, you know, so people are like, okay, we got to do something big, you know? That's true. They're just kind of trying stuff at this point, I think. Right, and COP27 is coming up, and there's already uh, scientists <laughs> literally throwing themselves into the streets to try to, uh, wow. you know, as protests against the, <laughs> the end of everything, basically, the end of our civilization, so... Um, yeah, all right. Uh, on to our next story. Uh, this one comes from the Washington Post, October 6th. And uh, it turns out that uh, there's a whole bunch of mangy bears in Virginia. No. Oh. Uh, yeah, mange, which is a disease caused by little mites uh, and causes the bear's hair to fall out, causes them to get all itchy, and, and uh, it's really not a pleasant disease. Uh, has been on the increase. and. Maryland and West Virginia, it's been pretty big for the last five to ten years. Uh, it's showing up in, in Virginia itself now. It's been in, also been in Pennsylvania for a long time. Can, can we kind of just, like, you know, develop some kind of technology so we can spray them from a distance? Well, the article <laughs> said know? they've tried a whole bunch of stuff. Right. They even tried catching bears. And Fire hose, maybe? Yeah. Bringing them in and, Boy. like, curing them of but then they found when they put them back into the wild, they got mange again. They got mange again, right? Oh boy! Because it's there in their range. Yeah, you can't really immunize them against mange. Yeah, and now this this could be a another global warming effect because winters are getting less severe, so 
things like those these little mites are wintering over more successfully, which means you know there's more bears will get caught by them. But um, but it's a growing problem, and they they don't have any uh, idea how that how to take care of it. So we just got to watch that one. Uh, another next story, another thing we've got to watch is in Alaska, the snow crab fishery has been shut down. Uh, you might've heard this one on the mainstream media, it did get covered. Last year, they actually cut the, the harvest by 90%, but then they found this year, they still lost 90% of the remaining snow crabs. And so it's really just, you know, normally there's like a billion snow crabs or so in that Bering Sea area. And it's, it's, this is, these are the crabs that get caught with that um, deadliest catch show that they have on Discovery. And uh, you see, someone just tried to call, so try again. And uh, you almost got through and we'll, we'll pick be up. discouraged, it takes a few tries sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the fishery is worth $100 million. In 2020, they, they took $100 million worth of crabs out. Uh, now in 2022, uh, they're gonna take zero. Uh, the fishery has collapsed and they don't know why. They think it could be a disease. They think it could be warming waters are calling, causing deoxygenation so the crabs can't breathe. Uh, but we do have to consider the possibility that they overfished. <laughs> I mean, if they literally don't know why the population crashed, some animals, you know, like the passenger pigeon, that depend on having huge numbers, you think you can take a whole bunch of them, but there's a threshold below which, you know, they need crowds. They've evolved to live at huge numbers. And if you go past that threshold, the whole population crashes, even though each individual female snow crab carry like 150,000 eggs. But, you know, maybe there was, maybe there was a line that we crossed because if you watch Deadliest Catch, you know that show was all just about all these people um, taking as many crabs as they could, and they were looking at oh the green you know, show we wanted to come they were looking there. at the uh, crabs yeah, we'll put purely on, as a resource and not you know sort of the holistic more Native American view where you look at them as something that you're sharing the planet with, and so they were putting that hundred million first, hundred million dollars, and putting the crab second. And that could be what's tipped them over into a crash. All right, we have a caller. Uh, caller, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hello. I was um, uh, wanted to comment on the way you talk about Enbridge and obviously the uh, possible potential pollution to uh, gr groundwater. Right. Um, and yeah. I don't know if if, um, if you want me to. I um, participate in. Uh, monitoring so oh. i wanted to remind everyone if they if you don't mind if they could do that through a it's an organization do you mind if i say the no, go right organization's ahead. name mm -hmm. uh it's um so it's isaac walton league of america walton w-a-l-t-o-n oh the isaac walton league and, yeah mm -hmm. i'm sorry I, i'm having trouble hearing you so <laughs> oh okay so so it's the isaac walton league of america yeah okay and so what we do, especially in, in the winter, is um, we take water samples and monitor for several data points. In winter, it's north, it's obviously for the salt. To, and they publish this data, put it on us maps and give it to municipalities so that they can, you know, control their salt usage, not to waste it, so it just doesn't go down the streams. And also monitor, you know, in other times of year for other types of uh, pollutants and oxygen level and that kind of thing. You can get like free test kits and all this kind of stuff and it's really easy and then you just go on a website and post your results and that's it. Um, and um, so, you know, it's just something people can do if they have a little time and they want to, it's mostly, their, their focus is on streams basically, but uh, mm -hmm. everything comes, I mean, the streams feed the rivers, rivers feed the lakes, so. Right. That's it. Well, that's great. So, what do you think about this these, this penalty, quote unquote penalty, Enbridge had to pay in, in, in Minnesota? I, I, yeah, I think it's typical. Um, I mean, Enbridge, so here's, there's so many conflicts. Like, they're a, a supporter of National Public Radio or University of Michigan's. So, I mean, they do report on Enbridge's 
you know, problems or their, uh, what they're, you know, what they're doing and they're all, their pipeline breaks and all that stuff. But, you know, I mean, it's, it, they're sort of uh, a company that seems to me has gotten in the back pocket of, of everyone. And so they're not going to be dissuaded from doing whatever the hell they want to do to wherever they want to do it. And that's kind of, you know, it go, it, it's just the weakening. I have a friend who lives near a stream who's been monitoring it for years and um, a commercial or, or a, a manufacturing a firm it, has polluted it down to the point where it's, you know, not no longer viable. And she's reported to the EPA several times and they won't do anything. Hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. That's all too common a story, but uh, they always you know. say it's the jobs. We can't, can't we can't lose the jobs. All the jobs. Huh. <laughs> if it's got to be either or thing, right? Is that a, that an Ohio story or? Yes, yeah, Columbus actually near Columbus. Near Columbus. Yeah. Oh, have your <laughs> have your Fred give us a call. I, I I'd be interested in reporting on that. Story. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll ask her too. Actually, she's a retired um, park ranger, so she probably has interesting things to say. I'll I'll um, I'll send her a text. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, those those retirees are you know stepping forward in a lot of instances, and they're able to say things and do things. Those of us that are still you know trying to earn a living don't have to deal with. All right, well thanks so thanks so much for the call. All right, bye. Yeah, that's uh, yeah an all too common story, and and I think it also is telling that this story. I found it on healingmnstories.wordpress.com. That should have been like a front page story. You know, I didn't see it on in the big Minnesota papers. It was on it, you know just a, a website that is dedicated to looking at those issues. So um, I guess even even they were embarrassed by the tininess of those those finds. All right. Well, but there is some big news. There's some nice big news coming up. Uh, one. The last two stories are definitely positive stories. One, uh, a new record was set this past week. Um, and Siemens Gamesa has a wind turbine. It's the model is the 14-222DD prototype, the double D prototype. And uh, it set a new record for wind turbine electric generation. It generated 359 megawatt hours in just 24 hours. And uh, to give you an idea of scale, that is uh, enough to run an average United States home for 33 years. And it, man it did that in just 22 hours. It's a huge turbine. It's got two, 222 meter uh, blades, which is big. It's, but those that's not the biggest turbine blade wise. But what what is so revolutionary about this wind turbine is They've designed it, they've gotten rid of the gearbox. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems with wind turbines today is, is you have these gearboxes that act like the transmission in your car and different gears shift, cut in at different speeds to keep the blade uh, speed uh, constant. But they've managed to do that by connecting the turbine blades directly to the generator. And they do that all now electronically. So they got rid of tons of moving parts and made the thing whole lot more efficient. Uh, they also have improved the high wind ride through, which is uh, a lot, some turbines are able to do this in really high winds. They adjust the, the pitch of the blade so that they can keep turning because otherwise one of the problems with old turbines was you'd get like 60 mile an hour winds and they could th blow themselves apart. Basically the, the blades could get spinning so fast. Modern turbines don't have that problem. But most modern turbines, when the wind speeds get up that high, have to stop generating altogether. They'll literally turn themselves out of the wind to avoid getting oh. damaged. This turbine has a great high wind ride through, and they are able to use the highest wind speeds. And so uh, congratulations to Siebens uh, Gamesa for, for setting that record. And it's just a demonstration that these things are all possible. I mean, that. <laughs> If we had gone into wind power the way we should have way back, uh, we started taking the first steps back in the Carter administration and, you know, Ronald Reagan put a stop to it. But had we pursued these technologies that far back, 
today we would be at the point of not needing any fossil fuels and we would be getting all wind and solar and geothermal energy um, because the technologies, the opportunity has always been there, but we have been so caught up with uh, fossil fuels that, that we haven't pursued it. But our last story, the really good one, uh, the International Energy Agency has made a prediction and uh, there's a story in The Guardian on uh, October 27th about this. Carbon emissions from energy to peak in 2025 in historic turning point, says IEA. In other words, we are putting up so much wind and so much solar so quickly that we are finally, you know, I reported last week that we were kind of, we've managed to flatten it out. We, we're, the curve is no longer going up. In the first part of this year, wind and solar were increased so much that it provided more than 4% more than the increased electric demand around the world. So we flattened it out right now and started going down a little bit. But uh, in just two years, we're gonna start going down. Carbon emissions are gonna start going down because what's happened is the Ukrainian war has forced so many countries to just stop using fossil fuels, especially from Russia, that they've accelerated their wind and their solar development and their geothermal development. And the International Energy Agency predicts that in just two years, it's going to start reducing the amount of carbon. So that is some- Bravo. Yeah, that is some fantastic news. And they, they list uh, planned expenditures that countries have announced. Uh, the US Inflation Reduction Act is one of the big ones and we we pan that one because of all the money they put in for nukes but it does also encourage wind and solar development to some degree so uh, that part of the inflation reduction act is good uh, you the eu has an emissions reduction package that they also are putting tons of money into this so is japan south korea china and india now this is not enough to to stop the global warming uh, yet. It's not enough, I mean, the fact that we're starting to go down isn't enough to uh, solve the problem yet, but it's still, wow. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. I mean, what's, we've just been on a steadily upward curve for, for so many decades. The, the prediction that we're gonna finally peak and start going down, that is amazing news and, and just, uh, just Hallelujah. wonderful. <laughs> and I do have to point out that this is without the help of nuclear because uh, none of the nuclear plants we've been reporting on, like Vogtel and uh, Oki Luoto in, in Finland, those plants aren't coming online. <laughs> they're, they're still having problems. They're not, uh, and there won't be any plants, you know, the, the number of plants in the next two years is minuscule because, so what's, what is I'm saying is because this time frame is so short, you know that these improvements, these switches are coming from wind and solar and geothermal and not nuclear. And so we just need to stay on that path and we can turn this around. You know, I've said it before, we are in a positive feedback loop, putting carbon in the air puts more carbon in the air and causes the things that put carbon in the air to increase. And, uh, but the good thing about a positive feedback loop is if you stop the input, if you stop putting carbon in the air, the rapid acceleration also stops. And so once we manage to get the carbon, stop putting carbon in the air. Because for one thing, uh, 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 global warming causes things to burn sometimes and then uh, smoke is actually mostly carbon, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Smoke has carbon in it. Right. Global warming causes droughts, and droughts lead to forest fires. And forest fires put lots of carbon in the air, which lead to more droughts, which yeah. causes more forest fires. And yeah, so... It's not um, good. Yeah, I mean, and over and over again, that positive feedback loop thing happens with carbon. But we are finally... Thank you, uh, world. I mean, this is a, a terrible positive effect of the Ukrainian war. I mean, we should not have needed a war to do this. I mean, the situation should have been urgent enough without having to have uh, this big war and all this economic suffering, but, uh, but at least it's finally happening. I mean, humans do seem to need 
to get prods like that sometimes. Um, but I'm, I'm just glad that it's happening. And, and uh, just remember every little thing each of us do. I mean, if you put solar panels on your house, you're helping. If you get an electric car, you're helping. If you take the bus instead of driving, you're helping. The effect of, hu of people changing their habits is also a big part of why the IEA is able to predict that carbon's gonna start declining in 2025. So take that Exxon who just had incredibly uh, record profits this last quarter. I, what did they make like $15 billion in profit in one quarter? And you know, they're gouging us by just raising their prices outrageously, but the handwriting is finally on the wall. Exxon, you're, you're going down. So couldn't happen to a better company, I think. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. This is Joe Damar and Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. Okay. Perfect timing. Here we go. I don't want more kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun. No nukes! No.